film discussion. Who killed Vincent Chen? Uh, welcome to our discussion of uh, Rene Tajima Pena's uh, 1989 film, uh, Who Killed Vincent Chen? And joining us for that discussion today is Francis Kai Hua Wang, who is an award-winning journalist, essayist, speaker, activist, and poet uh, focused on issues of diversity, race, and culture in the arts. And um, in particular, she is working right now on a project called Beyond Vincent Chin, Legacies in Art and Activism. So today we are going to be discussing the film, um, but I'm also going to ask Francis to talk to us a little bit about why um, she chose this film for us to discuss as well as her ongoing project that she's putting together uh, for next year, next summer is the 40th anniversary of the murder of Vincent Shin. So I'll hand it over to you, Francis. In 1982, uh, Detroit and Michigan was in the midst of a de depression and recession because of the auto industry was having a hard time because Japanese cars were starting to make inroads in the American market and, and a and the auto industry was really struggling with that. And so at the time, there was a lot of anti-Asian American sentiment, similar to what we see today, uh, but different as well. And it was very, it was localized in, in the Michigan area. Actually, it wasn't, it was national, but, but especially in the Michigan area. And in the middle of this, uh, a young man, 27 years old, Vincent Chin, he was Chinese American, he was at his bachelor's party and with some friends and they were at a, at a strip club, you know, for a bachelor party. And in the middle of this, uh, uh, two white men, uh, Ronald Ebens and Michael Nitz came up to him and said, it's because of you MFs that we're out of work. We implying the auto industry. And, and a fight ensued and they were, Let's see what else. And then, you know, a fight ensued, and then they were thrown out of the, the club, and then they fought in the parking lot, and then they split up. And then Ebens and Nitz actually stalked him and hunted him down for over, you know, 20 minutes. And they found him sitting outside of the McDonald's on Wood Woodward Avenue and started chasing him again. They pulled a baseball bat out of the trunk and hit him four times in the head, and his, you know, brains spilled out on Woodward Avenue. And they took him, his last words before he lost consciousness were, it's not fair. And then they took him to the hospital and he, uh, they turned off life support four days later. And all the people that had been, that were planning to come the following week for his wedding came instead for his funeral. And then a year later, uh, when this, when it went to court, because even said it's never you know, they didn't say they didn't do it. It was, they were fined $3,000. Well, first they plea bargained it down to manslaughter and then they were fined $3,000. And to this day, they've never spent a day in jail. And so in response to this, it was the Asian American community rallied together. And there was this, this realization that it doesn't really matter if we're Chinese or Japanese or Filipino or Korean because racists are not very smart. And so we're all at risk at times like these. And so they protested and actually were able to get a civil rights hearing on the case because once it's the criminal case, once it's decided, it's decided unless there's some sort of um, technical issue that you can appeal on, right? There has to, you can't just appeal because you want to appeal. There has to be a technical problem for you to appeal a case. And so they couldn't follow that route, but they, and then the judge actually, when the judge sentenced it, this is the other key moment, the judge said, these aren't the kind of men you send to jail. And he, he determined, he decided that the, the, the punishment should fit the criminal rather than the crime. And he based his, he based that on the fact that they both had jobs and not that there was a history of alcohol abuse, a history of violence, there was, you know, or anything else, right? Just because they had jobs and they hadn't been in, you know, serious trouble before, the judge uh, basically let them off. 
And so the Asian American community rallied together and they had uh, and pushed and received a civil rights trial. And the civil rights trial was important because it was the first time that Asian Americans were considered under civil rights law. And before that was, we take it for granted now that you know everyone is covered under civil rights law, but at that point it was new, it was a new idea. And so there was a lot of debate about whether or not Asians were covered, whether or not immigrants were covered, whether or not Chinese were covered as opposed to Japanese. And, and uh, but they got a civil rights trial in, in Detroit and, and Ebens and Nitz were found guilty and fined. Uh, but unfortunately that case was thrown out on appeal. And so they had a retrial and they moved the case to Cincinnati and Cincinnati had very different demographics and a very different understanding of the auto industry or rather a lack of understanding about the auto industry. And then they were let off on appeal in the retrial. And so again, to this day, uh, even Zindets have never spent a day in jail. And, and actually there was a follow-up case, uh, which is not in the film, but the follow-up case is, oh, we, I've just given away the whole film. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, but, um, presumably people have watched it before watching uh, okay. this or, you know, also it's Sorry. out there on Wikipedia for yeah, anybody okay, to okay. read. Okay, okay. Sorry, <laughs> I just, spoiler. I forgot that part. But um, anyway, uh, so there was one more case after that. And um, well, I guess there are two other cases. So Evans lost his job because of this and he appealed to get it back. Uh, but, but the... So Chrysler, I think it was Chrysler, I'm not 100% sure, uh, wouldn't give him his job back. And so he lost that case. But then also they filed a wrongful civil case, a wrongful death suit. And so he was, you know, they calculate, because Vincent Chin was going to support his mother. His mother was widowed. She, she was his only, her, you know, her only son. And uh, they kind of calculated how much, you know, Vincent would have helped and supported his mother. And and even he made one payment or two and then he skipped town and he has never paid that. And at the time he was interviewed by Michael Moore uh, for uh, Michael Moore, right? This is before Michael Moore became famous when he was just a local journalist. So he was interviewed by Michael Moore and he told Michael Moore flat out that, you know, you can't, they'll, you know, they'll get the money from me in like 3000 years. That's how long it'll take me to pay it off or, and other, uh, I can't remember the exact quotes, you know, thing, but things to the effect of, you know, you can't get blood out of a stone. And so he moved uh, his last known, at the last uh, time we heard of him, he lived in um, Nevada, where there's a really high, what's it called? Um, I think a homeowner's exemption. You can basically hide all your money in your home, and then people can't sue you to get the money that you owe. So because with interest, it now is up in, you know, it's over 10 million, $12 million. And, um, you know, the estate is still, the estate of Vincent Chin, still watching, still following him, but uh, it seems unlikely that they will get that back ever. So that's, that's uh, the very long, but, um, but in addition to the legal technicalities, the, what really is interesting about the case, I mean, there's, it's interesting in a lot of ways, and the film is fabulous for kind of getting into the details and, and interviewing the folk, the people involved on all sides and incorporating the music of Motown. And so you really have a sense for the time and the place. Uh, but since then, what has happened is that it really brought the community together and really helped the community mobilize and learn the power of solidarity. And right now, because we're in the midst of all this anti-Asian American violence inspired by COVID-19, uh, people are talking about the case and relearning the case and learning that there's much more power in solidarity and standing together than there is when people are separate or, or drawing their own, you know, drawing distinctions and divisions between themselves. So it's a powerful moment in Asian American history uh, in terms of community building and solidarity building. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for kind of giving that overview um, of, of not just the case, but why it's so important um, in, in the history of, of organizing and civil rights. Um, 
And so, so bef just before we uh, move on to talking about the film, could you give us a little more, you know, because you're working on this project beyond Vincent Chin, could you give us a little overview of the, of the work that you're doing to kind of, you know, document this legacy? Yes, thank you. Uh, the, so my project is called Beyond Vincent Chin, Legacies in Art and Activism. And this is, is, is funded by the Night Arts Challenge Detroit, Miami Foundation, Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation, and Culture Source, and, and has the support of uh, you know, University of Michigan Library and Wayne State University Press. And it, it's a, it has a few pieces to it. The first part is a book, an anthology of essays, which will be published at Wayne State University Press. And it's a collection of essays by activists and artists about what the Vincent Chin case means to you and how it has inspired people to do the work that they do over time. And I have a really a wide range of people, including you know, activists from back in the day to young activists today, to people who ran for office and, and artists who are creating new work right now to try to build a solidarity uh, with people today, including, I mean, some of the highlights is State Senator Stephanie Chang, Who's, uh, who's local, Ann Arbor originally, and uh, also uh, performance artist, Christina Wong, whose latest project is sewing masks for, for at first for first responders, but now for the Navajo Nation to try to create uh, this uh, ethnic, you know, pan-ethnic and, and racial solidarity. And then also, uh, uh, Captain, uh, Sick Captain America is one of my other essayists, and he actually uh, went to the Republican National Convention and walked around and talked to people uh, to try to, you know, expand their views. So he's fabulous. He's also been in Ann Arbor before and walked around the Diag and talked to people and he's on Michigan radio. But um, who else is there? Uh, I think those are the folks that you might know. There's lots of other people, but... Uh, but anyway, so that's the book. I'm very, very excited about the book. And then the other piece of it is a collection of the art that this case has inspired over the past 40 years. Uh, because, you know, from murals to t-shirts to record albums, and I should show you, hold on one second, sorry. I should have had it within reach. So, oops, this is by John Jang. It's called Are You Chinese or Charlie Chan? And it's a real record album. It's a record, it's got the little Tower Records uh, price tag on it. Uh, and so this is a jazz album with all, you know, uh, Asian improv arts, which who are really important artists for the community. And so, and we'll see, what else do we have? We have, the, there's a mural that's painted by the Day Project, which is Detroit Asian Youth, which was a group founded by the, by civil rights icon, Grace Lee Boggs. And so the youth painted this uh, mural in Detroit several years ago and it's safely stored away now in someone's basement. And, uh, and then what else? There's t-shirts. So Ryan Suda has a company called Black Lava at blacklava.net and he did a lot of the iconic early Asian American t-shirts before it became easy to get t-shirts and so there's a t-shirt that says V Chin uh, with the dates that Vincent was born and died and people still wear this I just saw I just saw a uh, Mr. Mui from Canton High School wearing it at a protest in Detroit just a few weeks ago so anyways these are the kinds of pieces that I'm collecting and with a partnership with uh, Michigan Library, hopefully we will create this digital arts archive so that people all around the world can find the art and access the art uh, anytime they want. And uh, because I've been collecting it informally for years, but unless you know who I am and where I am and want to take the time to kind of scroll through <laughs> all my stuff, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a little tedious even for me to find it. And then um, 
Yeah, those are the two big pieces of it. Hopefully we'll have uh, some sort of launch and a performance with ISLAND, uh, I-S slash L-A-N-D, Asian American Performance Collective, uh, who has performed, they've performed at, or we have performed at the Ann Arbor Library uh, before, but hopefully we'll do some sort of performance uh, to kind of bring all these together and, and to archive the, the performance as well. Oh. So I'm really excited about this. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's um, so we're looking we're looking out for the book for Wayne State and the the online uh, archive, hopefully from U of M libraries. Um, that's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, and then there's one more piece. This is still a little tentative. That's why I was going to do it, but I'll tell you. Uh, University of Michigan Press Fulcrum has a online digital uh, publishing platform where you can insert things it's not like an ebook right it's it's kind of like an ebook but with interactive parts so you can insert um so like if it was a book about a play you could insert a video of the play as well and you can do color photos and so they would like something about arts uh about the arts and activism piece of it so take the digital archive the next step would be to write about it and I just got a nod. This is completely unofficial uh, from the Department of American Culture, Asian, Asian Pacific Islander American Studies. That maybe we might think about making this into a class and getting students involved into writing uh, a book about this. So it would be an anthology of, of you know, students doing the research. And then the book can be living and it can continue on. Uh, we can keep adding to it as we go, which would be very exciting. <laughs> That. that sounds really cool. So I, ho I hope that part of the project works out really well. Okay, so so thank you for sharing all that. So um, yeah, so hopefully that people watching this will have future opportunities to, to educate themselves um, even more about this case and its legacy. Um, so let's uh, dive into this film. Oh, so um, let me tell you about oh, the film. So yes, the please. film is Academy Award nominated film. Uh, it's a beautiful film, and if you want a primer on the case to, you know, what is happening, it's the best, you know, single uh, piece that you can read or look at, and because she talks to everybody, and it's just beautifully done, which is why it was Academy Award nominated, and, uh, and I hope you get a chance to invite Renee to Jima Pena, because she's fabulous. Absolutely, yeah, um, just her work looks so cool, yeah. And and this film, um, I mean, we 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 can talk about it more, but I just I was expecting a lot more straight documentary. Um, and there's just so much kind of like uh, uh, artistic flair to it, you know. As you're saying, the the music and and things like that um, that really make it like a, a really rich um, um, picture. So yeah, so. Um, jumping in, it's, there's, there's just so much here, um, that it's, it's kind of even, it's, it's hard to, to know where to start. Um, but I think that, so I'm, I'm going to start out with, with a big question that's, that's hopefully going to propel us. And this is going to be a little long winded. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, so thinking about the murder of Vincent Chin, which happened 40 years ago. You know, one thing that I've been thinking about recently, just, um, you know, was it yesterday or the day before that, that George, the an first anniversary of George, George Floyd's murder. Um, so I've been thinking about these, these two cases kind of in parallel and, um, you know, and that we saw this sentencing happen um, last month with Derek Chauvin, um, you know, and, We'll, we'll see how that all shakes out in the end, um, you know, and the, the two cases are, ha, are, have a lot of differences, um, but a kind of thing that's connecting them together is, you know, you have a, a person in a marginalized group who has been murdered by someone who's in the dominant group. And the question is, will our society say that the person who was murdered mattered? Um, by by carrying out this form of justice by um, by choosing to punish someone who carried out this murder right and um, 
you know, and in the case of Vincent Chin, that was not that was not the case, right? I mean, the the murderers basically got a, a slap on the wrist, um, and that's kind of been a lot of the focus. Um, at the same time, after the Derek Chauvin sentencing got handed down, what I was overhearing a lot of people saying was, "Yes, this is good, but is this actually true justice that we're sending a person to jail?" Um, that and that's kind of like perhaps the only outcome. And so, you know, the the film raises um, it raises so many questions, and I think quite rightly, it doesn't really answer them. It just kind of leaves them open ended. Um, and and you know, at the end, the very end of the film, we have um, Lily Chin's you know play, plea uh, to for the government not to to not to close this case, but to keep it open. Um, and I guess my question is sort of if, if this case were to happen now or just, just talking about it now, um, has, has our, our uh, do we think like a vision of justice has changed for, for Vincent Chin? Um, you know, I think the, the movie kind of just like holds that question open, um, but I was just wondering uh, what people are thinking about how, how we would be talking about this this case now and, and what justice really means um, for this family um, and, and in this case now. I hope that question made sense. <laughs> well, one thing that strikes me is, um, Emily, you said like both of the cases are um, sort of a good measure of what, what makes someone's life matter, right? Like that's, and you know, we saw in the film that Vincent's life was devalued. I mean, they, those men didn't do a day in prison. Um, but I think like thinking about your question, as far as what would mean justice for either of those cases is that there has to be a period where we start valuing life before it's lost. Like we're just looking at these cases after somebody has been murdered and then we're trying to question whether or not that life mattered. And it's like the life should be valued before that. And so as to whether things would be different in the Vincent Chin case now, I, I don't know because I don't, it doesn't seem to me that we have really gotten to a point where we can value those lives initially. I just want to um, maybe build off of what Lucy just said and um, say that one thing that struck me um, from watching this movie, um, Who Killed Vincent Chin, was how the how this murder was framed in this larger context of a depression um, in Detroit and this kind of upheaval um, of uh, jobs, workers' jobs, auto workers' jobs being lost in the thousands, right? And the city undergoing such profound transformation. And when something like that, like an upheaval happens, sometimes people get really scared and they go looking for scapegoats. And um, I don't know, it just got me kind of thinking about how um, I... I don't know too much about this period, but I am aware that, um, you know, the line from um, the president of the United States uh, in the early 80s, uh, Ronald Reagan was sort of, hey, it's the free market, you know, get with it. Um, and, and so there was a lack of care. And just speaking to what Lucy just said, got me thinking about this, like a lack of care for, <laughs> Um, people's well-being, everyone's well-being, right? Um, and um, and so I think within that context, um, you know, um, it 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 sort of primes the pump for um, certain groups in a dominant caste to um, you know act out. Um, to put it really, really mildly, but 
it just got me thinking about how that film really, you know, the Motown, we mentioned Motown and how there's uh, the clip that comes back again and again of, I don't know what you call it, a barbershop quartet of those four, you know, singers going, get a job, you know, da -na -na -na. and that really kind of struck me <laughs> in the movie, how he just came back and back to this wider context. And again, it kind of speaks to Right, this lack of value of people's lives. People are considered cogs and expendable. And that's just um, kind of happening in the background of this movie and it's very present. Yeah, one of the things that people are doing in terms of the current like COVID-19 inspired, I call it COVID-19 inspired anti-Asian American violence, um, which is horrible, I shouldn't be saying that. But um, again, like what you said, right? People are, are, target, are, are struggling economically and they're looking for scapegoats, they're looking for an excuse and they're lashing out at Asian American elders and women. You know, there's Stop AAPI Hate has recorded, you know, over, over 6,000 reports of anti-Asian American violence in the past 12, you know, in 12 months from last March to this March. And um, what some people are doing is like, we have to prosecute, we have to prosecute. But then other people, depending on what, on the community where it is, they're saying, you know, maybe a restorative justice approach might be better for some of these communities. Um, and, and, and see how we can lift up the community altogether. And so there's all sorts of interracial coalitions that are trying to come together and find community solutions. So for example, in Oakland, there's a, a, a group of volunteers, mostly black and Latino that are walking Asian American elders around as they do their errands so they can shop safely. Uh, in New York, there's a group of um, black and Asian restaurateurs and activists who are raising money and, and uh, cooking meals to deliver, to feed people. And, and again, I mentioned earlier, Christina Wong's uh, anti-sewing squad uh, who are sewing masks for Navajo Nation. And so people are trying to, because those are the root causes that's causing the, the violence and the problems. And people are trying to find ways to, to meet those needs as well as speak out about the larger issues of white supremacy that are, are causing these, these disjunctures and causing groups to try to, to pin the blame on each other rather than finding solutions to the root causes. Um, one of the things that really struck me that, that was kind of one of the most difficult um, aspects of the film. Um, so, you know, building what, on, on what you all have been saying about you know this this lack of care or this this idea that the people's lives don't matter um, and and that kind of being the groundwork for for this this uh, violence that we're seeing now as as well as was happening forty years ago um, and at the same time the analysis presented by um, you know. Uh, Ron Abens and and his friends and his family was just sort of like, well, you know, it it just it just happened. Like, I mean, he says he's like, it's almost like it was just a preordained thing. And I think his wife at the end said, like, you know, six guys went out drinking and one one was killed and nobody knows why. Um, yeah, and I guess I don't I don't even know if this is <laughs> this is a question, but just like the um, like, where's the respon responsibility there? Um, and like uh, th the difference between like this analysis that we're doing, which is no, there are actually causes that are like bigger than a person versus this person who did this saying, well, it just, it didn't have a cause. It just happened. One of the things that really struck me was um, his friend, Evan's friends and family, a lot of them were saying he would never say anything openly hateful in public. I've heard him say things jokingly behind, like in family gatherings. And it's like, if you recognize that your friend is saying these things openly in a public place, like with close friends and family, that's still a public place. So 
it was just their defense was so thin and yet they still like still didn't get punished for it and it's just absolutely ridiculous and I know that I was researching this today and there was actually an article that came out today about the the case um and I think actually relating it to George Floyd but that may have been another article I read but yeah there's a lot of stuff people still talking about this and they're obvious it's obvious why <laughs> I was struck by that as well uh this whole idea he would do anything for anybody and yet he murdered someone in the street you know I, I feel like people are let off the hook too often because they're so gracious and they would do anything for anybody and yet they also commit these horrible crimes and are let off the hook for it it, it was a striking scene and in general, because I came in a few minutes late, the first scene I saw was uh, Evans and his wife on the couch talking so calmly. I, and one of the first lines I heard was, it could happen to anyone. I thought they were talking about the victim, but instead I think the wife was talking about her husband. <laughs> you know, the their denial of reality is so unbelievable. Christopher, that, that moment is one of the things I wanted to mention um, that it could happen to anyone. Um, it just speaks to what the general attitude was in their community. I mean, if you can believe that of your husband and apparently your neighbors and friends, then you think that that's you know, an acceptable attitude to go about with your daily life. And I think that that's just so mind blowing to me now. Um, I mean, I know it does feel like some things haven't changed for the better, but I have to wonder about that. Um, I'm sorry, I just want to step in real briefly. I know I already spoke, but, um, but yeah, just that, um, I don't know, it makes me, I don't, I don't know the particulars of the most recent spate of um, like high profile um, anti-Asian American violence in Georgia, but I do recall that the police officers in, um, on the case did defend um, the murderer um, with similar language. It makes me um, realize that this is still um, very much present in communities and white communities. Um, I think the dominant power structure still um, looks at this as, oh, this is an isol isolated incident. I think that the phrase um, in this most recent events in Georgia, um, you know, multiple murders was, well, he, was, he had a really bad day. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's like two pieces too that in, in what you're saying, Lauren, about the, the recent murders in Georgia and, and with Vincent Chin that struck me when we were watching this, it's like Rod Evans is sitting there so calm and his wife explaining this. And it's like, there's this, there's this hate crime that was committed that he refuses to admit had anything to do with hate, but then also the, the violence and the severity of the crime that he perpetrated, I think is really horrifying. Like his steps held someone and he beat him in the head with a baseball bat. And that just seems to be like, how does that, how could someone say, oh, it just happened? Like, that's how far outside of, uh, like you're saying, Christopher, how far outside of reality are they living? It just, um, it, mm -hmm. it, it's infuriating. I mean, you know. They even shared. He all, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Run. It just, the one thing that stood out to me about, all of this as well was that he he also said it's not something that you plan on happening but it just happens and for me that was like well <laughs> what were those 20 minutes in there where you were driving around looking for him what was that and because to me that's the a police plan. specifically said they had time to calm down yeah like the policeman said that mm -hmm. yeah the other thing, um, the other moment that stood out for me as particularly unbelievable 
was um, an interview with the first judge where he said that if a if a horrific murder had taken place, of course they'd be in jail or something of that nature. I, I don't have the quote right in front of me, but I don't understand what he thinks happened, what what he believes happened if if we can't classify this that way. And that that's just. I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I feel like there are facts. What what happened to facts? I, I don't know how to respond to that. Yeah, I think what the judge meant was legally, technically, it had been plea bargained for down to manslaughter. So in his eye, as a judge, it wasn't murder anymore. It was manslaughter. And um, but still, mm -hmm. and there was strict. something about him being alive for four days that like that like brought the charges down and for me I'm like this man suffered for four additional days and I just think that to me was backwards. Yeah I actually wanted to talk about um, the the plea bargain as well and in particular so there was a scene right with Ron Aben's lawyer um, when they're doing this television program and he's talking about, you know, oh, there are all of these cases. There are so many cases going through the system. You know, plea bargaining is a necessity. The judge kind of makes the same case to a newscaster. You know, I've got so many judgments to hand down. I can't possibly. And yet, you know, my understanding, yeah, and yes, like, you know, I, I can't even, I don't even know. It's like 90 something percent of, of cases are, criminal cases are decided through plea bargain now. I mean, it's something that has gone up dramatically, I think, since the 1980s. Um, and yet I think of plea bargaining as something that, um, that generally, that, that's how people get thrown away, right? Is that they don't get a case they're not given the opportunity to, to plead their case or have any witnesses. Um, and, and they're just pressured into pleading guilty to something that they didn't do in some cases. And, um, and then they just have this mandatory prison sentence. And I guess I just, what do you all think about, it just seems it worked very differently in that case, then it seems to work for most people who are not white, was my sense. There was a moment um, when they were interviewing the judge, or I don't know, it was um, Evans at the end, and he said that the, uh, the justice system worked exactly as it was supposed to. And I was like, I think that's true because the justice system is set up to benefit white people. And he even says that. He's like, these two men have jobs, which no, one of them was unemployed. And then, um, Vincent Chen did have a job. He wasn't employed, upstanding citizen. What, where's his, why don't you care about him? It was so obvious the judge is clearly racist, um, embedded in the same system that they all are. And I think another piece of that is the police that testified was a black officer. So is his testimony viewed as less than if it were a white officer defending Chen? And would a white officer have defended Chen? Actually, the black police officer was never even called to the trial. Right. So he's in the film being interviewed, but he was never, he never testified in the trial. Yeah, yeah, I think he's like, they didn't call any, any witnesses, no character witnesses or anything mm -hmm. for, for Vincent. Yeah, and they also didn't research like what happened. They, for the, for the criminal case, the entire case happened at the McDonald's in the street right there. Right. They didn't go back in time to see what caused it in the beginning. And actually, American Citizens for Justice, which is the nonprofit organization that was founded at the time, they went back and researched to see what happened first. And then what happened? They're the ones who interviewed all the dancers at the, the Fancy Pants. And they're the ones who kind of put all the pieces together and to tell the, the larger story of what happened. Yeah, that was really as an astonishing part of this documentary was watching the footage of the TV program where the interviewer is asking, um, I think that activist who's maybe spearheading that group. Who, um, oh, Helen Zia. Helen Zia, yeah, yeah he asked, who's, she's amazing. Wow, she's just, she's stunning and like how just quick, quick on her feet she is in, yes. in this particular scene, you know, in the, in her, the interviewer says something along the lines, and I can't remember exactly, but like, gosh, what do you think about this? You know, these groups stirring this case back up, it was all tied up, and now, oh, how messy. And 
Oh gosh, I loved how she was able to say right then. Well, you're not, you're not going to like what I'm about to say, but I think that these groups were pivotal. These were these were crucial. You know, the the, the facts that they were able to unearth, the interviews that they conducted that law enforcement didn't do. And you know, Elizabeth's point, just like how the system works for some, it works to protect whites from any kind of accountability, right? Where um, and others are minimized. The other side of that is certain testimony, the African-American police officers. I'm also thinking of that scene from um, the retrial of, in Cincinnati when a juror, a white woman is being interviewed and she says, you know, she's talking about the case and you know what was compelling and what wasn't. And she talks about how one of the um, strip club dancers uh, who is white's testimony was yeah, that, you know, that checked out. That was, that was, um, I forget what the word was, credible. Whereas um, other dancers, um, an African-American dancer who plays a role who witnessed the entire thing, um, perhaps wasn't. You know, it made me really, that made me really stop and think, like, why was that? Why is that juror thinking that that testimony was okay? And another testimony by a person from a, um, a different race wasn't. Yeah, one of the real heroes of this case is Vincent's mother, Mrs. Lily Chin, yes. and she rallied and she traveled the country giving talks and drawing attention to the case so that people would know what was happening. And she said it's because she doesn't want any other mother to have to go through this. And when Joseph Valetto, who's a Filipino uh, postal worker, was killed in a hate crime in the, in the 90s, I think, uh, Mrs. Lily Chin was there at the rallies to get support. But it's interesting, well, it's very sad actually that how much re mothers have to do just to ensure a trial happens at all. Um, I think in at the time, you know, Mrs. Chin just assumed, that, and a lot of people before they they know, they just assume the justice system will take care of it and they'll have a trial and and so now these days, the question, will there even be a trial is huge, let alone will it be done properly and will there be justice in the end? And if you think about George Floyd to tie back to your opening question, right? It took a year of nationwide protests before they got uh, you know, a trial and, and a, a result that made sense to people. Um, although the same day we got the verdict, the Derek Chauvin verdict, you know, another, I think a child was killed by police in, in Ohio. So it just keeps on. Um, I have a little bit of a personal story to share um, after watching this film or actually while watching this film, I was communicating with my colleague, Emily um, and realized that I didn't know much about what had happened, actually really nothing about what happened to Vincent, Vincent Chin, um, but also to my shock, um, my father was employed by Chrysler in 1982 in Highland Park. Um, and my parents grew up uh, in this area uh, in, in just outside Detroit and were living there at the time. Um, I, I had a recollection that my dad was laid off when I was a young child and I wasn't sure what year that was. And so I had a long discussion with my parents that night to find out what their memory of, of this uh, incident was. And it was kind of eye-opening to me. Um, so here I have someone who is directly affected by the layoffs in Detroit at the time. Apparently my dad, um, due to seniority, was not laid off, but um, within, um, I think, three names on the list, um, he would have been. Um, my mom is someone who follows um, news and and things like like trials and missing children and things like that very carefully she's always been that type of person and neither of my parents remembered this and that was shocking to me absolutely shocking all i got from my mom was she vaguely remembered um that there were demonstrations with smashing um cars and um you know she she, she maybe recognized the name my dad had some memories of coworkers who said very derogatory things back then. 
he still has, he still knows someone who was laid off at that time that still says negative things. My dad, a very soft-spoken, non-confrontational man, has tried to address it with him and had no success. But here, here was something that affected my, my immediate family in a way as a child, and I knew nothing about it, and they didn't even remember it. And that, that you know, watching the documentary, it feels as though this was getting national attention. It feels as if Vincent Chin's name should be equivalent to George Floyd. And yet, and yet here are people my, just a handful of miles away and who, whose livelihood was directly connected to what led to this violence. And they weren't even aware of it or certainly not to the degree that we would be now. So that's another interesting element to, you know, um, how, how people absorb this information, how it gets out, how, how much attention the nation might, might be paying or not paying to such a violent, horrible incident. But it was, it was a very interesting um, learning experience for me. I teach this class every year at the University of Michigan, a civil, Asian American civil rights class. And I teach this unit, I teach this film, and I always have the students raise their hand, like who's heard of this case before? And even in, if it's a large class, 75 people say, I'll get like five hands who've heard it before. And then I'll ask again, like how many of you heard about it not in an Asian American studies class? And four of those five hands will go down. And so even, and at Michigan, right, we have mostly Michigan students and even Michigan students don't know. And so there's another film, a great follow up, kind of a follow up film made by Curtis Chin called, Curtis, uh, called Vincent Hu. Who looked, that looks at the impact of this case on the community and it talks to people who were kids growing up at the time in or Asian American children and teenagers who were growing up uh, at the time and how it affected them and how it led them into activism and, and people who heard about it later in time and maybe went and ran for office and uh, and yeah, he, he presented it at the library too when the film first came out. I, would, I do remember the incident occurring. I was, in, I was 20 years old. Um, and I, I thought that maybe I'd seen the film already, but it was the Phil Donahue show, the talk mm -hmm. show. I watched that religiously. And I, that's how I learned so much about it, about the incident. You know, otherwise I remember seeing an article in the free press. I was in college, so I was on the other side of the state. But um, yeah, it's, it, it all kind of came back to me when I was seeing the Phil Donahue show. But, um, and his mom though, uh, Vincent's mom made such a, a pivotal part of, of the story. And by even just getting on that show and uh, with, the, with the other advocate. <clears throat> um, so I think it's, I think that we're talking about it now is fantastic. And I would love to get a Vincent Chin shirt um, and to keep talking about his, you know, this, what happened and, and just the callousness of, of the folks involved. The other thing that was, struck me earlier though was um, uh, Evans, yeah, when he was talking about how he had to spend the night in jail, it was the night before Father's Day, and I just was, I'm sure I was spewing things at the screen, but uh, just like, wow, what a, poor you, you know? Yeah, he said something about how he didn't have any blankets, and I was like, Oh, oh yeah, I know. Yeah. I well, that must have been so difficult for you after you murdered somebody in cold blood and didn't get punished for it at all. I wrote down this thing his wife said when they were talking about all the publicity they were getting with the second case, you know, and she's like, it's just an instant nightmare. And then she said, your poor little heart just shrinks. And I just, <laughs> like, I, I mean, I have no words besides sharing what she said, but that's just, yeah. um, that really struck me. I think, I think oh. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, just one thing that, yeah, this is, I mean, gets back to like Christopher's point when he <laughs> logged in to watch the movie and like he's a couple of minutes in and he's thinking that these people on the couch are talking about Vincent Chin 
and his murder and know they're talking about, you know, their horrible circumstances because they had to endure all of this attention and scrutiny and it's so unfair. I just wanted to say though, that what I liked about this documentary, although it was kind of, I was almost pushed to my limit as I watched the beginning of this documentary to, 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 to have to endure the astonishing lack of empathy and self-awareness on display by the murderers. Um, I was really pushed to my brink, um, but what I like about this documentary and why I think it was, one thing I really liked was how um, Vincent Chin's mom gets the last word. There are other voices that are tapped mm -hmm. and you do get to see them. You get to experience, you know, the guys joshing each other as they're getting bus to the strip club for their businessman's lunch or whatever. And you get to hear though, Vincent Chin's friend say, I don't really think that like it shows a lack of value of his life, how this turned out. I don't think his life is really valued. And you get to hear his friend say that. You get to hear, and you get to more than hear, you get to feel his mom um, at the end of this documentary in an incredibly powerful way that's almost like silence is the dominant um, audio, <laughs> but you feel what, how she feels as a mother, you know, talking about, wanting to pursue justice and how she is really tireless in her pursuit of it and advocacy for other people in a similar spot, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what, you know, I should tell you the, so Corky Lee, who's known as the unofficial, undisputed Asian American photographer laureate, uh, he unfortunately passed away in January due to COVID. But he was here photographing the, all the protests at the time. And a few years ago, he decided to hold a candlelight vigil in front of Ronald Eden's house in Nevada. And he organized all the, the local Asian Americans in Nevada. And they had a film screening. They watched the film. And then they went to Eden's house. And they, they made a display of, of Corky's photographs. And they had some candles. And then they passed out flyers to all of Ronald Eden's neighbors. And um, it's just kind of a, like, wow, the, it was a funny event. And apparently Ronald Eden's, I heard, uh, moved right after, shortly there after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, I was just wondering a little bit about the title of the movie, because the title is a question, right? Who killed yes. Vincent Chin? when we know who did it, but uh, I guess the, the filmmaker is kind of prompting us to think a little deeper on a systemic problem. Uh, is that what, what you all took from that? The fact that the filmmaker chose to title the movie as a question? Mm -hmm. that, that's... Um... Yeah, one of the really intriguing things that um, I was thinking about. And yeah, I think it was it was a really smart to, to title it that way. I think not only because it's a question that really draws you in, because like, oh, is this gonna be a murder mystery? And it's like, no, this isn't a murder mystery. This is like a culture mystery, right? Like we know who did the murder. The question is why, did, why are things the way they are that allow this murder to happen? Um, yeah, I, I think that was a very smart decision on, on their part to, to title the movie that way. Yeah, and the other thing to remember as we watch this film today is that this wasn't the only case. Like sometimes because when people learn about Asian anti-American violence, this is the one, if, if they learn anything at all, mm -hmm. this is the one case they learn about. But there are you know many, many, many cases of just like it that happen all across the country all the time, as well as cases of police brutality and police killings as well. Mm -hmm. and, and so there are definitely larger systemic issues at play still today. And then, and then after 9-11, there was this another layer of it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, anti-violence um, against people who were perceived as stereotypes of terrorists that of course hit a lot of people. Um, so. And then again, now with the anti-Asian 
COVID inspired things where people are getting contact in multiple kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we're, we're kind of at our hour here, so we mm -hmm. should wrap up. Um, can I highlight a few other places people can go if they want to learn more? Absolutely, absolutely. So one place to kind of read it, read Helen Zia's account of this case, and, and she's one of the main activists, and she um, is in her book, uh, American Dreams. Uh, yes, American Dreams. You have to double check the title for me. But American Dreams by Helen Zia. First chapter, the first chapter is about this case. And the rest of the chapters are about all the cases since then, uh, up until the point that she wrote the book. Uh, there's also Curtis Chin's film, Bits and Who, that we talked about. Uh, Paula Yu's book, uh, From a Whisper to a Rallying Cry, is coming up. No, it just came out. So you'll have her at the library soon. She's fabulous. There's also a plaque in Ferndale commemorating the case uh, in, oh, I forgot what year it was, but a few years ago, the Michigan Bar Association noted this case as um, what call a legal milestone case. And they have, they've installed a plaque. Uh, it's in the media, it's at Woodward and I think a, it's right outside the location of what used to be the Golden Star Restaurant, which is where Vincent worked on the weekends as a, as a waiter. He was, he was a draftsman working in the auto industry and he was going to school at Lawrence Tech and he was working as a waiter on the weekends, but that's where they held all their meetings, where American Students of Justice held all their meetings. And so there's a plaque in the median right there on Woodward Avenue in Ferndale uh, talking about the, why it's a legal milestone and um, also what Fern, the city, and there's another plaque in the city of Ferndale. And one of the other legal things that's important that came out of the case is that um, part of the reason is that the sentencing went so awry was that no one was there to advocate for Vincent's family or for Vincent and Vincent's family at the sentencing. So since then, people have uh, the attorney, the prosecutor, the DA is always there at sentencing now. So that's a change that happened. And another change is the victim impact statements. At the time, that was not a thing, but now it's it's very routine and we hear about victim impact statements all the time. So that's another change that happened because of this case on the legal side. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that stuff. And um, yeah, I'm just looking to see if we uh, have have these things in the collection oh, you <laughs> that do. we can get. I know you do. So people, <laughs> so people can make sure um, they can learn more. Um, but thank you so much, Francis, for coming and discussing this film, choosing this film for us to discuss and um, you know, sharing your work with us. I, I really appreciate it. And thank you everybody for, uh, for participating in this discussion. And um, you know, hopefully we'll generate some interest uh, ab about the history of this case. Thank you. Thank you so much for having Thank me. Thank you. And thanks for all your comments. It's great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good one.